take a moment and pray together. God, we thank you that your work all around us. We thank you that um, through every lesson that we learn, through every success, through every failure, um, you walk beside us. And most especially in our failures, we pray that you might continue to teach us. We give you thanks for this word that you've given us, and we just ask that uh, as we think about it together now, that you might continue this teaching that we've already started and uh, continue to give us the wisdom that only comes from you. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Self-confidence is an important thing, right? If you didn't have some level, some degree of self-confidence, you could never achieve anything. You wouldn't even try. But there is a danger here, and that is in believing your own hype. That is a danger. And Jesus talks about this in uh, Luke chapter 6. He says, Woe to you when all people speak well of you. And it's something that I remind myself pretty frequently, right? It's an important thing to remember. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. So we can look around the world at politicians, we can look at sports stars, we can look at uh, musicians and performers, and of course, we would expect in all of these kinds of veins to find just tremendous amounts of arrogance and even hubris. I want to tell a story about a politician, and since he's long dead, nobody's going to get on my case about it. <clears throat> Back in the 1930s, Upton Sinclair, do you, do you know who Upton Sinclair was? So Upton Sinclair wrote that famous book, The Jungle, about the meatpacking industry in Chicago, and it's gross. I read it, and it, it's gross, what he describes in terms of how things were done in Chicago back at the turn of the century, the, the 20th century. But he made a name for himself by writing books like this. And he decided he was going to run for governor of California in the 1930s. And this was during the Depression. It was 1934. And his, his view was, well, the best thing that I have, the best skill that I have is as a writer. So I will write a book in support of my candidacy, which seems to be a very logical thing to do. So he wrote a book. Guess what the title of his book was? I'm going to look at it very closely because the title is so stupid that I have to. It was called, I, Governor of California, and How I Ended Poverty. I, Governor of California, and How I Ended Poverty. And it was a book that was written in the past tense about his brilliant campaign, about how he was elected in a landslide, and everything that he did then afterwards to make life so much better for the people of California. Guess who lost the election? Right? So things don't always work out exactly the way we expect them to. Now, when we talk about success and failure, when we talk about humility, I think that um, Paul is among all people in the Bible, maybe one of the greatest people for us to look at and to study and one of the reasons I say that, it may seem counterintuitive, but I'll tell you, the number of people that over the course of time when I've been talking about, oh, who do you like to read in the Bible? You know, who are some of your favorite characters? Do you like to read Paul? People will say, I hate Paul. Can't stand to read Paul. He is the most arrogant person in the whole Bible. And I can understand how you would take that away. And even reading today's passage, you can see how people would take that view away. Now, at this point, you know, after having lived with Paul for long enough, right? My middle name is Paul, by the way. Um, <laughs> after having lived with Paul long enough, you come to realize, you know, this is kind of like, you just accept this is who he is. It's like an old friend, you know, you overlook, start to overlook their flaws, but I definitely see how when you're reading this particular passage, you might come to that understanding. So, Paul understood highs. He understood lows. He knew about life from top to bottom. And in this little passage, um, one of the things that we ought to probably talk about is his relationship with the church at Corinth. So, he had actually founded the church there. And one would think that that would entitle him to some great status, like, thank you, Paul, thank you for 
being, you know, our founder and the one who saved us and the one who brought us to faith and all this kind of stuff. That was not the case at all in terms of the Corinthians' relationship with Paul. In fact, what it appears happened in Corinth after Paul got done preaching there was that a whole group of other people came through, preacher after preacher. And what they did through time was they talked themselves up and they talked Paul down to the point where the church kind of descended into a sort of a, a group of factions where some people would say, well, I follow Paul. And others would say, well, I follow Peter. And others would say, well, I follow Apollos. And Apollos was this guy that came in who was apparently a great preacher and came in um, a little later. He's described in, in the book of Acts. And some people would just say, I don't know about all of you, but I follow Jesus, right? Which is the right idea to begin with. But Paul, it's clear at many points in his relationship with Corinth, and frequently the only relationship he had was through letters. And we call this the second letter. Some scholars say this is kind of a, a group of fragments of other letters that have been put together to create this letter. But we have this idea that Paul is writing to a church that he's having a real struggle to be able to understand and to be able to even talk to. And in fact, at the beginning of, um, I think it's chapter 11, he mentions these super apostles that have come through. And he's comparing himself to the super apostles. And not, now when we say super apostles, he doesn't mean that like in a positive way. He means the so-called super apostles, right? That you all have been listening to. But still, he feels compelled to talk himself up. And here he says, you know, um, it's necessary to boast. Nothing is to be gained by it, but I'll go on. And the reason why he says that is because he feels like he has to, he's been disrespected so much that he feels like he needs to talk himself up at least a little bit. And one of the things that he was most uncomfortable about, and maybe for good reason, is even though most people, when they talk about the history of Christianity, they say, well, there are two people who are perhaps the most important people. First is Jesus, obviously. The second is probably Paul, in terms of giving us a sense of what it means to be a Christian in terms of our faith and our understanding of what it means to follow Jesus, these two people. But yet, what we know about Paul is that he was a terrible preacher. Now, you look at me skeptically. Didn't he found all these churches? Yes, but one of the stories that's told, even in Acts, which tends to put the best face on everything, is the story of how Paul went on so long preaching one night that they were in a second story and there was somebody sitting on the windowsill and they fell out the window because they fell asleep. So that's the kind of preacher that Paul was. He admits it. He says, you all, I know what you all say about me. You all say that you know, his, his letters are really powerful, but then when he gets here, he can't preach at all. His speech is contemptible. So he understands what this is like. So he takes the only card that he has up his sleeve or out of his back pocket or wherever you keep cards, right? The only thing that he has to pull out is this one thing, is the fact that he maybe more than any other of the leaders of the early church, had direct revelations, direct visions and experiences of Christ. Now, this was important because Paul also felt kind of insecure about the fact that he didn't walk with Jesus. He was an apostle, but he had never walked with Jesus. He came a little too late for that to have been the case. So all he had were these visions, these experiences of God, but they were tremendous. And so when he says in here, <clears throat> when he says in here, you know, I'll talk about a man who years ago was caught up to the third heaven. When he talks about that, 
he's not talking about a man. He's talking about himself. This was just a first century kind of convention as to how you spoke about things like this. Because you didn't want to appear too puffed up. So he says, I know a man. Really, he means himself. And there are several different places in the Bible where it talks about these visions and these revelations that he had. So you can look at Acts chapter 9, that famous experience on the Damascus Road. You can look at uh, Galatians chapter 1 and 2, where Paul describes in his, own, uh, in his own hand, you know, really what he experienced. And you can look right here. Paul had these tremendous experiences. He knew what it was like to live up here. But he doesn't want to talk about living up here. He wants to talk about living down here. And that's where he goes back to, I don't want to tell you about that. To keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me. He wants to talk about this thorn in his flesh, which we don't really know what that was. It could have been any number of things. Some people say, well, he had an eye disease that would flare up from time to time. Whatever it was, it was kind of, when it came upon him, it was debilitating. Some people say it was actually um, epilepsy. Some people say that it was uh, maybe just headaches. Some people talk about this as, well, maybe it was just the spiritual challenges of dealing with these churches. Nobody really knows what it was. But these are the things that he wants to talk about. He wants to talk about his difficulties, his challenges, his trials. He doesn't want to talk about the great things. Now, Paul says he prayed three times for whatever it is to be taken away from him. And the answer he kept getting back is, my grace is enough for you. And strength is made perfect in weakness. That's the response that he got which I take as a nice way of God saying, no. You want this taken away from you? The answer is no. And so Paul has a choice at that moment. He can decide either to kind of rail against God and get angry and walk away, quit, and say, I can't believe you're treating me like this after everything that I've done for you, after all these churches I've founded, after all this stuff that I've been through for you, I pray for relief from this thing that's been troubling me and you can't take it away from me? He could have done that. He could have walked away at that point. And this is the very same challenge that we have every time that we come up against failure. Have you ever known anybody who was so stuck and so convinced that the world was against them, that all their failures, that everything that they'd done that hadn't gone right was somebody else's fault. You just get trapped in that thinking that says, you know what, everything is against me. We can go there. That's not where Paul went. Paul went in a different direction. He understood that in order to succeed... You've got to go through humility. And in fact, when you think about it, what's a better definition for humility than this idea that strength is made perfect in weakness? That is humility. In other words, I'm not going to boast about the things I've done right. I'm going to boast about the things that God has done through me even when I screwed them up. Strength is made perfect in weakness. So this is the challenge that's before us every day. Whether things are going well, whether things are going poorly. I mean, Paul understood these highs. He understood these lows. And we've got those same kinds of highs and lows every week. Because that's life. That's what it means to be human. The question is, what will we take away from all those lessons? Will we allow our strength to be perfected in weakness? Will we allow humility to be our teacher? That's the question for us as we go into this week. Let's take some time now and pray together.
God, we are grateful for all that you've done for us. We know that every success that we experience, it comes from you. We know that every failure that we experience is a test for us as to whether we'll learn anything whether we'll allow ourselves to be humbled enough to change direction, to change course, to think about what went wrong. We know that power is made perfect in weakness. And we pray that as we go through this week, that you might show us how to be strong in all those weak places in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.